Hi everyone, John from Gaming in the Wild here, and I have something interesting for you today. Um, a couple of weeks ago I reviewed the game Ultros. It's a wonderful Metroidvania that does some very unusual things. I think it's my game of the year so far actually. I really adore the game, so I reached out to the developers Hadok and one stepped forward from the team. It was Hugo Billet, who has worked on some other games that I reviewed as well. Hugo had some fascinating things to say about the making of Ultros, including Metroidvania map design, coming up with a cosmic ecosystem and the risks of designing a game that doesn't hold the player's hand all the time. And I originally made this as a podcast episode, but I thought you guys on YouTube might like to see it as well. So I'm going to run some B-roll behind the interview, so you can see what the game looks like as you hear the conversation. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please give it a like. You can subscribe to the channel for more like this, and I will tell you about the channel's Patreon at the end. And with all of that said, let's get into it. This is the interview I did with Hugo Billy of Hadok, the makers of Ultros. So I'm very happy to be joined this week by Hugo Bille, who is part of Haddock, the development team behind Ultros. Um, and Ultros is a game that I've been enthralled by, that I've been talking about a lot on the podcast. So Hugo, it is great to have a chance to talk to you. Congrats on the release and, and thank you for making the time. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, and I mean, how, is it, how has it been? Um, how long was the game in development for and 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 how has the release felt like is it how has how's your week been i guess it's been a, a crazy time for you it has yeah it's been a roller coaster for, to be sure and it's 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 been a long roller coaster because we've been making this game for more than six years uh of which i have been along for the ride for the past four uh so i i, I probably won't be able to, to answer all of your questions about how this all started i'll try um but uh, as to uh, this past week whew, like we, we we've had some really good reviews. I um, we were always a bit unsure because what we we're making is kind of weird and polarizing, and, and it, it can go every which way. Um, when people don't know what to make of what they're playing, they yeah, you never know if they're gonna like it or not. So I, I was I was I breathed uh, I breathed a, a sigh of relief when some of the sort of heavier journalists out there, like Stephen Totilo, came out and said that this is astoundingly good actually. Because then I was like, okay, I can. I can let him decide that. Now, now that's the discourse. Uh, so that was calming. <laughs> I bet it was. Yeah, the, the response has been super nice. I mean, um, you are right. It's like, especially, I guess, with it being a Metroidvania that, that messes a lot with being a Metroidvania. You're wondering yeah. if the, uh, the fans of that genre are going are gonna to grok it, you know? And some of them. Have, so, so, I mean, obviously, we've had even, I mean, reviewers and plenty of players who don't get it completely and that, that's absolutely fine we were we were counting on a lot more of that mm -hmm. actually um so um yeah really happy with how the reviews have turned out and uh uh of course uh, with a game as sort of complicated as this in terms of like the ecosystem and, and all that uh we were counting on getting a bunch of like people getting stuck like really stuck not not being able to continue their games uh so we we had some first aid, aid services going on this mm -hmm. week where i sort of poke around in people's save files and see if I can, well, heal them and also fix the bug that caused them to get stuck. So it's been, I mean, we didn't have any of that in our pool of, of reviewers, so so we knew that we were pretty good going in, but once you scale that up to tens of thousands of players or however many we have, I, I don't have the numbers, of course some people are going to run into trouble. So that, that's that's been an, another source of, of, of roller coastering for me. I bet, I bet, I mean... Uh, for what it's worth, my, my playthrough was clean. Um, I hit walls, yes. but they were the kind of walls where you just have to look at the map, think a little bit harder, and, and you know, try things out, and you get there in the end. So, yeah. Um, but I was thinking, like, um, for people that aren't familiar with Ultros, I mean, I'm going to drop a spoiler warning after a couple questions here. That makes sense. But I thought to start with, we could talk about some of the basics. So I was thinking, for the uninitiated, if there's anyone listening that is not super familiar with Ultras, could you give your um, your overview of what the game is exactly? Yeah, so like you said, it's a Metroidvania game at its core, right? Or at its, uh, at its outset, at least, uh, with a, a very psychedelic vibe, both in terms of art style and audio, but also in terms of just trying to make something that is mysterious and weird and you don't really understand what's going on. Um, and in the spirit of that, it sort of gradually transforms away from, from the combat and exploration. Well, maybe not so much the exploration, but it, it becomes less about combat and more about gardening, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I've always been like, why aren't there more garden vanias out there? Garden vanias, it's, it's, nice. it's a genre about learning, taking a world and making it yours, making it familiar. Why aren't we like really literally putting our mark on it more? 
Right. And it is it is a super unusual take on the genre, which we will get into. Uh, but I think that the first thing that people notice probably, um, if they watch a trailer, if they watch a stream, if they look at some screenshots, is that this is quite an unusual looking game. It's quite an unusual yeah. sounding game. And I would say taken as a whole, there is a super strong aesthetic happening here. Um, and I was I was kind of digging around a little bit. I hadn't heard of Haddock before, and I was like, "Who's involved in this?" And it seems like it's a bit of a a super group um, of uh, Swedish <laughs> artists and developers, from what I can see. And um, on your YouTube, it says that they are from the far reaches of Sweden, Gothenburg, Malmo, and Stockholm. Um, so I was wondering That's if awesome. you could tell me a little bit about um, the, the the people that came together to make this game. Um, you said that you joined two years in, but um, how did it all come about? Yeah, uh, so. From I, I think the whole project was born between the the three people that preceded me on the project. Like so, that's Niklas Orkiblad, known as El Huervo, uh, Morten Brygeman, and uh, our uh, music and audio lead uh, Oscar Rudelius, uh, who have been friends for a long time and always wanted to to make a game together. Oscar and and uh, Niklas have have um, collaborated a lot before on on but they've made music albums together and they've made several games together. Uh, but they wanted to make something with Morton, and uh, it uh, it sort of morphed into this project. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over these bits a little bit because when I got on board, uh, about probably a year and a half after after initial development started, uh, they had produced a, a, a full demo of the game, um, and I, I really came in because Morton was going on parental leave, uh, so they needed another another programmer, and I, I I was kind of known as the Metroidvania guy in Gothenburg. Mm-hmm. Um, so they at first I guess they wanted me to play test and then they wanted me to uh, to uh, replace Morton for a bit and I, I kind of loved it so I, I stayed on uh, when Morton came back. Um, what else can I tell you about the sort of beginnings? I'm, I, I can only really use the stories here that Morton and Nicholas have been telling me about. Obviously, the Nicholas has been very instrumental in terms of the vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he uh, was the sole artist on the game for a long time mm-hmm. and um, he. Uh, uh, he has a very close collaboration, like I said, with with Oscar. You can always, you can almost hear that, or you can only, almost feel that when when you play the game. That the art and and the music, especially, they they sort of know each other very well. They, I would even say the uh, the the text as well. There's like there is a very thick atmosphere that seems to permeate everything that is going on in the game, and it, and it does click together in a, a really cool way. So I was very curious yeah. about because sometimes you feel that maybe a game starts with maybe like a some kind of prototype and that it's arted or that it uh, has a soundtrack that comes a little down the line and this one feels more um together in in a in a way that is quite striking i thought i think so too i'm i'm a bit struck by it myself because um compared to other games i've worked on this i think has been directed very lightly um we've all had very free free hands in terms of like what where we want to take this uh so i think it's a testament to uh, to all of us sort of just listening to the work in a way because it's also a distributed project we haven't most of us haven't met more than a couple of times over the course of this um so getting that right should be a challenge but i think we've we've mind read each other surprisingly well uh, part of that is probably testament to to all of us having like kind of similar backgrounds and tastes, um, and and also just I guess accepting the challenge of, of being a distributed team. I mean, we even went through COVID um, during development here, and and really taking taking it seriously that we uh, look at the work that the others are doing and try to amplify that and try to uh, to um, roll with that. Mm-hmm. That, that's the best explanation I can give you. I'm also a bit perplexed at how how well this all fits together. Yeah, you feel it as the player. You feel it as the player for sure. There's something about the just the, the base feeling of how this world sounds. It sounds juicy. It sounds alive. The art is so lively and alive. The, the text is so mysterious and dense. And the way that the gameplay unfolds with its um, various systems that we'll talk about, it, the interconnectedness of the game, and the interconnectedness of the the systems and the aesthetic of it seem to have some kind of symmetry that is somewhat unusual and and tangible, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. I, I guess I I think some of the re- reviewers have uh, sort of taught me about what we have been doing in terms of like, or 
we've been thinking, I've been thinking about it a little bit, but how this whole psychedelic vibe is, is so much about thinking about the way that everything is connected. Yeah. Uh, and that, I mean, if, if there has been a, a core sort of theme that we've pursued uh, consciously, it's, it's the idea that everything is connected, right? So that's, that's been a huge thing for me as well. I should mention probably that I've worked on this game as a, as a designer and programmer and have been working on all parts of it really, but primarily the, the, the gardening and post game stuff has been my focus. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'm looking forward to talking about that with you after we drop the spoiler break, so I don't want to ruin this game for anyone. I think it is a game that people should go into with as little knowledge as possible because the sense of discovery was really part of the magic. Um, but mm. something that I wanted to talk about, actually, in terms of design, was that in such a visually busy game as this one, um, it's quite decorative. Yeah. There is a lot happening on screen at all times, whether it's colour or animation or exploding plants as you walk past them and all of the things that you're doing. Um, it must have been um, a little bit of a design challenge to, to I guess, lead the eye of the player and to allow them to see what they needed to see. Um, but somehow the game did it, um, in my opinion. So I was, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about that and how that, how that went. Yeah, that's, that's been interesting. We've, we've had some fights about that for sure. <laughs> Um, and Nicholas has, has walked out of most of those uh, on top. Uh, so, I mean, it, it makes sense. When you have a style like this, the, you don't really want to, to hold it back, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the, then, of course, the question is, how can we maintain this, this psychedelic overbearing uh, like assault on the senses uh, while still sort of doing what we can? to uh, give give players options there and and because uh, some players we knew already in, in playtesting had they, they were so overwhelmed that they they couldn't focus on the game um but i think it's interesting some uh, coming back to the reviews here uh I, there have been some reviews who have who've actually come out and said that like sometimes you you don't see if an enemy is a part of the background and you say you, you first first you go like it's not supposed to be like that that's bad design and then, I don't remember who wrote this, but it's like the first time you eat kimchi. It's a bit weird, but then you want to try it again. And <laughs> then suddenly you start to like it. And, and uh, I guess that's exactly what Nicholas was, was going for with that. So uh, we, we have added uh, accessibility options to sort of tone down, especially the backgrounds, uh, which I think has, has been very useful, in particular for players who, who can't deal with that sort of uh, uh, overstimulation. Um, mm -hmm. so we, we've been at it for, for, from a couple of reasons, but generally, I also think that Nicholas has had quite good instincts with this. There have been cases where, uh, you know, background elements really stand out, but for the most part, um, he, he has a, an, an idea about which, which parts of the game he wants to, to, um, what's the word, uh, emphasize mm -hmm. and, and not so, so, um. All in all, it's that, that, that's, been, that's been an interesting journey. That's one of the first things that people ask us about as designers, like how did you manage this art style? Yeah. And uh, the short answer is we kind of didn't. Uh, but uh, the accessibility options were, were uh, really nice. Yeah, it's been, it's been fun talking about people who are playing this over in the, um, the podcast Discord. There's like a good six or seven of us playing it side by side. Um, I have been the one who has been like the most obsessed with this game there have been some that have struggled with the uh, the visuals and being lost in things um but for some reason for me personally the the overload seemed to trigger something in me some kind of a mm. i've compared it a little bit to walking into a room full of like uh, yao yao kusama or chris or philly and being having these colors that just hit you and light your brain up and you feel it in your body and for some reason ultras the sound the look the overwhelming nature of the whole thing I just really drank it in. But um, I think mm. for some others, they've definitely put those um, accessibility options to work in it in order to get through the game. And I think that that's been really useful for them. It's good to hear. D there's some other design stuff that I'm interested in as well. Like um, it's also to do, I guess, with the the um, the busyness of it. There's, there is a, a, a maze-like labyrinthine play area in this game um, with lots of different uh, blockages, lots of different challenges, lots of different things you have to figure out to get through it. Um, and I guess it's always the case in a Metroidvania, but you're going to come into contact with stuff you have to figure out later. You kind of notice that you have to, you know, come back later, like the statues in the game, um, things that you cannot reach yet because of jumping. Um, but I, I felt that as I was moving through this game that there was 
there weren't any like big moments of just coming up against a brick wall and not knowing what to do. I did feel like I was mm. being somewhat, I felt like there was like the invisible hand of like uh, me just, just knowing how to proceed. I'm glad to hear that. It's, uh, it's always a gamble. It's always a gamble. Like even, even with a game as great as say Hollow Knight, mm. like I made a wrong turn at one point in my first Hollow Knight playthrough and I was lost for three, four hours. And I mean, you, however you design these things, that that's going to happen to some people. And they might even write you a bad review because of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but I was I was wondering, because I felt that this game does have quite a loose hold on the player, if that makes sense. Like I, yeah. Um, and But for some reason, for me, it felt that the balance was right. It felt like there was a wild place to explore, but also that I was being eased in the right direction. And so I was wondering about your thoughts about striking that balance between offering freedom whilst also signposting where to go in a game like this. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's the reason they brought me in from the beginning, because the, the reason I'm known as the Metroidvania guy in Gothenburg is that I, early in my game design career, I wrote this piece on Game of Sutra, which is now called something else, uh, gamedeveloper.com, um, about how Super Metroid does this. Uh, it was Think of like what Mark Brown does nowadays with, with the two, Game Makers Toolkit, like the Boss Key series. We went through the whole game and like, this is how the game guides you without you even knowing about it. So I've been obsessed with that kind of stuff. Um, so we've, we've been, we've been using, you know, some of those tricks. Um, but, um, also I think going more of a, like there's a, there, there's a tension there between Metroid and Castlevania. I feel where Castlevania is more open and less interested in leading you the right way and more like, ah, you can get lost. You're going to find something interesting. Um, so I, I feel like we, we're, we're a little bit in the med- middle, I suppose the whole loops structure as well kind of makes us. Um, kind of simplifies things for us, um, makes it so that, but, but yeah, at selected points in the game, usually when you have a new power up, um, we sort of reset a lot of the world state, um, which um, make I, I think that that really uh, allowed us to get crazy with uh, with the structure of the world because we knew that we, we already all, always sort of have that reset to fall back on if that makes mm-hmm. sense we have this area near the start that we know that people are going to be intimately familiar with um so we, we can use that as a foundation mm. and, and branch out from there uh, can i ask you about what some of those tricks are yeah for sure i i mean um super metroid i mean it has so many different ones but um, one of the one of the under underrated ones, I think, is the way it starts with you go on a linear journey down down through the shaft into the uh, the first power up, and then you go almost all the way back, and and that establishes like a home base of sorts. Mm-hmm. You 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 get within like ten minutes of Super Metroid, you have a part of the game that you feel at home in. You're you're, you're intimately familiar with it, and that allows you to sort of build a mental map from there. It's it's really important with the, the, the process of mental mapping that you have sort of a foundation uh, streets that have like a main street mm. that you go back and forth on and, and get to know it are generally easier to learn. Uh, so th- there's stuff like that. There's stuff like when you get a power up, um, there's usually a, a, a place in the game. We don't have that many of them. We, we don't have that much of this actually. Uh, but, but when you get a power up, there's usually a place where you're supposed to use that power up that's in the other end of the world. So Super Metroid does a, a lot of really, especially for its time, really clever things about how it uh, sort of plants the place you're supposed to go in your head right after you get a power-up, usually by having a small challenge that shows you what the power-up can do. And that room probably looks a lot like the room where you're supposed to use it, stuff like that. Um, but like I said, we've... All right, yeah, we have probably been more interested in subverting those expectations mm-hmm. than than playing straight with them. So that that's, I mean, we, we start that by going more the, the Castlevania direction, mm-hmm. I guess, and saying that. Uh, so some mnemonic devices, basically, some mn- mnemonic design devices here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, we, we, we do harsher stuff or more firm stuff than that as well. Like when you, when you get a new power-up, we just, draw a line back to to the center of the map mm-hmm. and you don't have to follow it um you you can because if you do you you, uh, you just trigger the loop but we, we felt it was important to show that that's 
an option for you now, right? You can still explore with the new stuff you 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 uh, discovered. So I think it's it's a complicated ass game, right? It has different phases, and um, I think we uh, mess with it more and more as as we go along. But maybe we should talk more about that after the spoiler warning. Funnily enough, the next the next line of my notes here is spoiler warning. Ooh. So um, for people that um, have not played Ultros, um, I think you should. Um, especially if you're interested in Metroidvanias. Even if you have played a lot of them, this is one that does something a little bit different. Um, so for those who are dropping out right now, um, please do drop out if you haven't played it. It's a game of surprises, and you should experience them for yourself. But for everyone else, we will be back right after this. <laughs> enough you were talking about subverting the genre just a moment ago um, and that is the next question that i have here because ultros is ostensibly a metroidvania um, but there is much more to it than that might suggest um, the first big surprise for me was the introduction of the loop so after mm -hmm. after the period that people might have played in the demo immediately after that the game resets itself you you lose the skills that you have got including the uh, the metroidvania holy grail of your double jump you are reset um, and as a Metroidvania player who loves them, who plays a lot of them, this is this is a bit of a sting. You're like, wait a second. I didn't sign up for a roguelike here. This is a Metroidvania. Yeah. I want to feel my progress. I want to grow. It's a bit of a rug pull. And it definitely stung at the, at the, at the beginning there. Uh, but the longer that I played, the more I came to enjoy this decision. Um, I felt that it was the first in a series of decisions to subvert, to twist, to build upon what the genre is. And and, and I was wondering, is is this this clearly seems to be built into the game? It's a Metroidvania that um, will appeal to Metroidvania fans, but that it's also quite different in many ways. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk about this this subversion of the Metroidvania. Yeah, I mean, that, I guess that comes in at least three phases. The first being the the loop, the second being the the increased focus on gardening, and the third probably being the connection mechanics. Um, and the loop was, is the only one of these that was actually kind of in play before I, I joined the project. Uh, so another one of these that I, I can't talk in detail about, like how it came about. But we've, I, I can talk about how we worked with it mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's been challenging to, to get that balance right between subverting the genre but, but also like not, not doing something completely different. I think we've, we've uh, faltered a little bit in the, in the communication here because in the, in the first couple of days since release, a lot of people were like, what, is this a roguelike? I don't want to play that. Because yeah. like you say, people come in yeah, you take away a double jump, the Metroidvania fans are gonna they're gonna be they're gonna be <laughs> I totally get that. <laughs> I, especially if they think it's forever, right? Which it isn't. And I, I feel like most people most people have probably uh, hopefully figured that out now that we, we do keep a lot of things. You do get your double jump back very, very quickly, soon. Yeah, you get used to it. Sooner and sooner for that matter. Um, and uh, it becomes uh, an added layer of because Metroidvanias are about uh, exploring the unknown, right? of not knowing what's around the corner, what areas are, uh, am I going to discover, what power-ups am I going to get, how am I going to get over that gap, how am I going to get through that wall. You start to fantasize about these things. And we wanted to extend that, uh, which a lot of game, other games also do, to exploring a system. Like, how does the system work? Um, what 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 is the loop? Did time just rewind? Did time move forward? Did it do both at the same time? Because some things don't change. Mm -hmm. All the plants change. Basically, everything about the, the ecosystems uh, just sort of regenerate. Uh, plants grow bigger. Uh, critters and enemies come back, which could both be a natural cycle and a time loop. It's, it's kind of both at the same time. Right, and the characters seem to remember or not remember. Some seem to have a little quiver and inkling that something is going on. Others just seem yeah. to blank out again, like Vasa blanks out. Qualia knows something is up. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the hardest bit there has been uh, losing your, your cortex abilities, which are the, 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 the abilities in the skill tree that you sort of... Um, uh, yeah, you unlock over the course of the first loop, and then they're all gone. And uh, 
pretty much immediately after, because th- th- this is the moment where we need to sell to the player that uh, actually it's not it's not as bad as you think, right? <laughs> so w- within a couple of minutes, there we in- we make sure to introduce the mnemonic my soul, um, which allows you to to uh, lock abilities for the next loop, so that it won't won't be as bad next time. You get to sort of pick your favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also get really sort of explicit about how uh, plants that you planted in the first loop uh, have now grown and allow allow you to reach other parts of, of the sarcophagus mm-hmm. if you couldn't the first time. So uh, you're not really threatened with like having to replay content other than like the first couple of rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, for, for, for a while the first loop was actually even longer. So one of the bigger interventions we did was just cutting it down so that... You, you don't get even more attached to your stuff. Yeah, it's quite a chunk of gameplay. Actually, it's quite a chunk. You do, you do get. Um, um, I, I guess if there is a, a gameplay loop here, in addition to the loop that we're talking about, it is that you're going to explore. You're going to discover. You're going to find your way to one of the points that's marked on your map. You're maybe going to have to fight something to get through there. So there is like a a tight little gameplay loop of what the player is going to be repeating in different ways there as well, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and, and then especially with the gardening, I, we spent a lot of time thinking about how can we do this in a way that doesn't alienate uh, the Metroidvania audience? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do they come to this genre for, and can we give it to them with, with this gardening thing? Because we, we, we knew like from way before I was involved with the game that there was going to be a gardening mechanic. Uh, um, I, we, we didn't necessarily know how it worked, but that gardening would be sort of the, 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 the positive impact that you have on the world um, with sort of violence being a more negative uh, counterpoint to that. Uh, that. That was sort of in the core concept. So, but, but yeah, there, there was a lot of back and forth about how far to go with it and how to make a gardening system that, that speaks to, to Probably not the combat aspect of Metroidvania so much. There are actually other games that are making that kind of Guardianvania right now. Uh, look up Nectarmancer if you haven't. Um, but we, we wanted to focus the gardening aspect on the um, on the exploration aspects and then to, to some extent the platforming aspects of Metroidvania. Like the, the, the building of the mental map, getting to know the space, uh, making it yours, mm-hmm. um, and the sort of... Um, uh, ge- geographical uh, problem solving that comes with that. Like Metroidvania pl- players like to remember the shortest path between spaces and, and where all the shortcuts are. So we, we figured like using plants to create shortcuts and uh, um, even even um, sequence break, right? There are so many sequence breaks that you can do using the plants that we hadn't initially planned for. And the QA then came in and found like, are you really supposed to be able to do this? Yeah. And we're like, yeah. Especially with the splicer, right? Yeah, that that was crazy. <laughs> uh, that that came in quite late, actually. Uh, at least with it, with that that aspect of it, we had like a, a laser pointer for a long time that you could use to like cut cut plants. But yeah. I think it was only in the last year that I added the, uh, the the functionality to actually move branches between species. Yeah, that is that absolutely bananas uh, mechanic, um, and there there are quite a few. I mean. Um, back to the subverting of the genre, like as a Metroidvania player, like you kind of, you, th- you tend to feel that you, you're you going to get some familiar abilities that you've seen in other games. But for some reason, like in Ultras, I was like, sometimes my jaw dropped open. I was like, I can't believe they did this as well. There were a few moments where I was like, first of all, the loop, okay, that's quite a lot. Um, and then the ecosystem of the game comes into play and you realize it's important and the living network arrives and you're like, the splicing arrives and you're like how did these people make this game um but the ecosystem (laughs) itself i mean when it first arrives um ultras does have an ecosystem of plants and animals spread throughout the spaces um and at first they seem hostile at first they are there are plants that will kill you there are animals that will attack you um and it feels somewhat familiar it's what we're used to in games we hit things with swords we slice through plants Um, but as this game progresses um, there is a, 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 sh- a shift that takes place. There is a mental swing that takes place where we start to understand that the plants that seemed like a problem are actually useful or even invaluable. And we learn that the animals that are attacking us are better left alive than killed and harvested. Um, and there is like um, a very interesting slow process of realizing, even it's even in the skill tree, if you have enough nutrients and you've unlocked a certain skill, 
then maybe your your pheromones are suddenly better and the animals don't see you as a threat and you're just walking through this this natural space. I mean, I mean, as a player, this this felt like low key profound in some way to come into mm. harmony with a, an ecosystem in a game in this way felt kind of special. Um, so I was wondering about yeah. about your thoughts about this, about integrating an ecosystem like that into a game. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, I, I remember that like the first thing we said when we started working on on these aspects is that we're not going to have an ecosystem simulation because uh, because then like like we have to set some ground rules or we're never going to finish this. It's going to become too complicated. So we had like cr enemies do not interact with each other. We don't have a food chain. Uh, they don't like do stuff when you're not in the room. Uh, plants kind of do actually. Uh, but we, we needed to keep oh, so it. You're not going, you're not going full rain world with this. No, no, we, 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 I don't think we, we had so many other things going on as well. So, uh, I had to put some kind of a break on it. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, I'm, I'm really happy that people are getting that experience that you, you talked about. Because when I was like pitching what we were doing to friends like two or three years ago, like we want to make a Metroidvania that gradually shifts into something else, uh, everyone was like, are you really going to pull that off though? Are people really going to buy it's that? It's a fair point. It's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. And I've been working on so many games, and I think we all have lately, where... We, we start out wanting to do audacious, audacious things and you get to a certain point in development where you're like, well, we're going to have to cut everything that's interesting about this because we, we have to meet a deadline. Uh, so I think we were all really adamant about keeping the audacious bits this time. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But we, we, we really wanted to try. Right. And I mean, when I was looking into some of your work, I saw that you'd worked on Faya as well. Yeah. Case in point. Right, exactly. It's another game where the the ecosystem is the gameplay, where we are encouraged. I mean, I mean, it always bothers me a little bit um, that in games we are breaking crystals, we are chopping down trees. I remember being in Spiritfarer, arriving at an island and seeing these beautiful giant ash trees, and the first thing I'm invited to do is to saw them down and take them away. Me too. It felt so wrong. I wanted to leave the world undisturbed, but it's not usually an option in games. So it seems like there is in Fair, in Ultros, there is something philosophical about this. There is some kind of, there's something beneath this, this will for the player to experience an ecosystem or their relationship with a natural environment in a different way. Yeah, I mean, that's what kind of connects these two in, in a way, the, the, the connection with the environment. Or, or in Fay, it's it's like feeling like you're part of the forest and part part of the gang there. Uh, in Ultros, it's, it's just feeling that you're part of the cosmos, I guess. But all you're almost not playing the character in the end. You're playing the world. Mm. Uh, that, that's taking it far, maybe. But <laughs> that, that's that, that's the target feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I mean, I think that's super important. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've, I've, I've worked a lot with the uh, IGDA Climate Sig for the past couple of years. I helped start that group. So I've, I've been really into not when I made Fee actually, but uh, over the course of Ultras' development, I've, I've been very, very involved in like what does what what does eco design look like in, in games? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we make games that support the goals of keeping 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 the planet habitable? Mm -hmm. and I think this is one of the sort of cultural parts of that that are that's critically important, like the the extractive mindset versus the regenerative mindset, mm -hmm. right? So you, you start Ultras very much in an extractive mindset. What can I get from this world? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think Metroidvania at its co at its core, or maybe not at its core, but in its in, in the way it's traditionally done, it's a very extractive genre. You you go into an alien place and you take what you need, uh, and you don't really care for it, right? It's it's uh, it's just a mine for you to uh, to exploit. But uh, we we yeah we definitely wanted to do that differently here. So so it it shifts towards more more about gener regeneration it's not, and the loop really helps there because you keep getting reset mm -hmm. uh there is i mean um extracting things for your own benefit is, is ultimately pointless because you're you're temporary the only permanent thing is the world around you right and it turns out that if you in this game you are punished for being overly aggressive if you do take out every animal um, then you are losing some of the capabilities of that species, and there are gameplay motivations for you not doing that in this game. You you yeah. you have to come around to that way that way of thinking if you want to proceed through the game fully. Yeah, if you want to get the good good ending for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we did 
in the last year, I I started thinking more that okay, games are powerful. Games can change the way people think. I I, I knew that, but they're probably not as powerful as we has as, as we have kind of assumed in this design. Like every player is not going to come with us on this transcendental journey of, of uh, becoming a gardener so we, we we need a way to sort of honor the players that don't quite get it mm-hmm. give them an ending that they can accept so that's where the sort can of they, escape can, i don't know who could into. accept that ending that's that's such an <laughs> just gonna bug out <laughs> yeah yeah but at least you're sort of you do get credits you do get, you do get credits you you, you get nice vibes if you, if you don't want to play more, you, you hopefully feel like that's okay. It, it's a bit modeled on, on what Cave Story did with the, the, the escape ending in that game, where you sort of... It, it's also very frustrating, uh, but you can accept it if you if that's what you want to do at that moment. I, I also think it made the post-game much more interesting for players who are into it, because it's optional, and then you choose to do it. It, it would have been a bit more obnoxious if you'd feel, felt forced to, to do all that uh, living network stuff. Yeah, and speaking of that post game, I mean, another big surprise moment for me um, was the arrival of the living network in the game. Yeah. Um, so you're, you've been learning a lot about the, um, you've been learning a lot in this game about the, you've been slowly learning. It's been drip fed to you a little bit. You'll meet Mr. Gardener. He will tell you a few things about this and that. You, you take some, you internalize some, you don't quite know what it's useful for. There is a half of the skill tree that you perhaps don't find immediately useful. Um, but you come to learn that it is essential. Um, and the arrival of the living network in the game was one of the more audacious moments, as you say it, where you think you're playing one kind of game. Suddenly, at the bottom of the map, you find the source of a signal that you can drag and attach to nodes and wire up this map. Um, it has gameplay implications and the fast travel aspect, but more importantly than that, um, for me at least, was a new sense of purpose that I didn't have before in the game. Mm. Um, I, th- I suddenly felt that there was a game hiding within this game. Um, it made me look at there the is. map in an entirely new way. Um, these innocent looking crystalline buds suddenly became the absolute object of my attention. Uh, barren mm. spaces with no growing spots suddenly became huge problems. And they were previously spaces that I had just run through. Should you just clarify that uh, it's, it's just not, not, it's not just the pre-placed nodes, but it's, you, can, you also extend the network through the plant that you have planted yourself. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You have to solve the problem. The plants. Whole new set of problem yeah. solving there. Um, and suddenly the game sprang to life. I was already loving it. And it sprang to life with this second wind that really took it somewhere completely unexpected. Um, so how on earth did you guys come up with this um, and incorporate this into the game? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that and other people say that as well, because th- this only appears in the second half of the game. And naturally, because of the way playtesting works, a lot of our playtesters didn't get that far. So this is where we have the least sort of data to go on. Um, so we've been a bit nervous about like, is, is this really going to work? Uh, it seems it has for some people. Um, but, um, I mean, we knew from the start that we were, we wanted to have this contrast between gardening and, uh, and violence. And, uh, from the beginning, I think the first idea was to have kind of a demon souls esque uh, world tendency system for this. Like you plant a seed and you get one point and you kill an enemy and you get a minus point and that sort of affects the look and, and, and yeah. Um, but I mean, looking back at games like Demon Souls, and I mean they stopped doing that, right? Uh, we talked about Silent Hill 2 a lot because it, it has similar systems with its endings, where like if you look at a, an item in your inventory too many times, you're locked into hmm. one of the endings. Um, so we, we wanted to do something that's more self-evident, like easier to explain, more physical, um, where like one room can be in good shape, another room doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be. Like the the world isn't one monolithic. Um, one-dimensional sort of gauge between good and bad, um, and I, 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 we, we toyed with a bunch of different ideas. But the the idea, of, since since we're all about like connecting with with the world around us, we felt like uh, finding ways to connect your plants into into a network. It sort of made made sense. It also felt a bit like pollination. You feel like you're a bee almost. You're running between flowers. Yeah, this world needs a little something. It's 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 I th- maybe that's what made it somewhat emotional in some way. It's it's this 
you know, we, we are all living with this kind of this this climate breakdown situation we are all in. And there is a feeling of hopelessness that's attached to it. And some games like uh, Terra Nil, for example, yeah. um, give you a little breath of hope, make you feel yeah. like they give you this moment where you are able to do something. And it does feel like in Ultras when you are reconnecting this 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 uh, this suffering biosphere that you are an active participant in it, as you said. Yeah, and you get, I mean, you need those feelings to, to be able to do stuff, to be able to, to, to get the energy to act. I'm, um, I'm, I'm working with a different climate game right now that's, that describes itself as an inappropriate, inappropriately joyous game about climate change. <laughs> I think we need more of those. Right. Well, it was appreciated for sure. Um, I, I think yeah. that there was, there was little things too, like um, when you do actually connect nodes, there is like a little burst that happens on the screen and uh, the music swells and suddenly you are dancing through the map, just lighting it up with this signal. Yeah, um, and then a lot. It feels good. Um, and then occasionally you'll come to the, the meta puzzle of it all, which was suddenly ledges that um, you've previously found your way to, no problem. You have to carry the signal there. Um, yeah. But it's too far for you to do so. And so you have to put into practice, um, you have to address the, the characteristics of all of the plants, which you've just been growing yeah. to harvest from. That's where you really need to use, to learn them, to get to know. That's another, obviously, that's another sort of system that, that you're exploring. How do these plants work? What are their secrets? How do I get them to, to, to produce a flower yes. or, or a fruit for that matter? Yeah, and the game doesn't doesn't t doesn't take your hand and lead you down that path. I felt that that was quite an active experience as a player. Um, you are problem solving, and you really do have to squint a little, think a little, look at like the the, the monstera plant with the electric nodes in it, which has previously been horrible for you, and have a little mental breakthrough that actually this is one of the most useful plants in the whole game. This plant that you've hated so far um, for the living network. Yeah, yeah, absolutely to connect the network. Um, so learning and the game didn't teach me it felt like the game didn't teach me that i felt like i had to think into the game to, to pull that out somehow if you know what i mean yeah so there's probably lots of stuff in there that you have no idea about as well <laughs> like we we've grappled with that a little bit because it feels like we, we've cut back on complexity a lot because it, it felt like we're making minecraft here we're making like a 500 hour game that people are realistically actually going to play for 10 hours mm. so how much of this are they actually going to discover uh, so we, we've we've scaled back on it and in, increased the tutorialization more than we, we probably would have from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, but it's still audaciously deep the the, the the gardening like all of the all of the plants have these little quirks to them different ways that you can plant them in different environments to make them do things um I'm sure there are there are things there that people haven't discovered yet. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the the big the big hacks that occurred to me whilst I was doing this was that, was that if you pull out the little pollinated node in the electrical monstera plant and always carry one with you in your splicer, you can just bang that onto any plant and suddenly. Oh yeah, you're right. I, I ooh, I hadn't thought about that. Like whether it has flowered or not, you've suddenly created a node. So that became like my go-to splicer thing. That's smart. I like it. That that's. Possibly the only flower that you can actually just take with you. Yes. <laughs> so suddenly Monstera, Monstera nodes were the go-to. <laughs> good find. Oh, yeah, that makes them super useful, actually. That's good. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun designing all those plants. They, um, we wanted to make sure they, all, they each have their own sort of um, personality. They, they grow in quite different patterns. Like one is a moss that grows along the, the, the walls and ceilings. And uh, there is a tree, and th the third one is like it behaves like water almost. The 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 Argeus plant that mm -hmm. just runs downhill. Yeah, second most MVP after the uh, the Monstera, which name I've forgotten was the Argeus. I can imagine Staccati. Staccati. Is the, yeah. the rambles. <laughs> um, so and 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 yeah, that 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 was a thrill to design because they all had to have a personality. They all had to give fruit in some kind of interesting way. All had to produce flowers in some kind of interesting way, and they all. Almost all of them, at least, needed to have some sort of platforming element as well, some something that you use to get around or, or have use for some other way. So, like, you have the, the, the Sprogan sort of meadow that lets you run fast or even run up walls. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's always, almost always, uh, some kind of platforming element to it as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I it was um, it was hard to get all of those. This is, 
this is what you're not supposed to do as a game designer. You're not supposed to have an element in the game that uh, fulfills many different purposes at, at, at the same time. But then again, that's how nature works. So we're in a bind there. Like, if we want to make something that feels true and feels organic, um, that, that that's kind of where you go, but not too much, right? Because people are going to not get it. Mm -hmm. it. It can definitely, and it has definitely gotten too complicated. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I guess the, the third big surprise is that the splicer, which arrives so late in the game, which does allow you to take parts of plants and graft them onto other plants um, indefinitely to create these um, truly bizarre, unpredictable, very, very useful um, creations um, arrived so late in the game. And after the loop, after the living network, I was like, this game cannot do more. Like, uh, <laughs> suddenly we have this splicing thing, which seems like a, a game development nightmare. It's like some some t mini Tears of the Kingdom thing. It is, it is. Where you're just sticking everything together. It was weird playing Tears of the Kingdom while working on this. <laughs> we were like, they're doing this. And, well, obviously you can build a lot more varied things in Tears of the Kingdom. We, we were kind of proud at that moment that at least our stuff doesn't vanish when you, like walk away for 100 meters yes <laughs> yeah it was it was a lot so you said that splicing came quite late in the in the um the development yeah we uh we knew we had um uh, uh, the laser tool in um, in infinity lake but initially that, that was actually the first extractor program that we made uh, but initially, it was uh, the idea was that it would just be something that makes it easier to to cut branches with more precision mm -hmm. than the trimmer, and also more permanently because the trimmer everything you you cut with the trimmer just grows back. Um, but that that was a bit like we, we we did want it to do something more, and we I I had this idea floating around for a bit about like what if you could save a branch. Uh, <laughs> and you know, obviously, the first uh, first reaction to that is no, we could never pull that off. Right. The, then I decided to try, and it was like, well, th there are probably going to be bugs with this, but we can live with bugs. And then we actually went and fixed all. Yeah, as far as I know, all of the major ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very fun being in the um, the gardener room at the very top of the, the gardener area, Ooh. where there is like a big puzzle you have to get high you have to get higher um, you have to get high that's that's ultras for you get high and ultras um and i i spent like a i felt like i was doing what is not supposed to be done um it was not practical at all it took hours but taking little bits of plants plugging them together most of the plants you jump through but the occasional one like the solid log plant the og moomin i think mm. you can add yeah. to a, a plant um, and it will give you a platform that you can jump on. And so building this very, very manual, laborious, long platform with little Og Moomin logs in it that I could jump up to the top with. And it didn't feel like an elegant solution, but it was my solution. And it, it, felt, yeah. it felt great to do. Glad to hear that. I, that. That's why that room is there, essentially. It's like, well, here's this impossible challenge. Uh, go nuts. Right. <laughs> right. But... Um, Something else that I wanted to touch on um, after all this mechanical stuff, if you still have time yeah. to talk a little longer. Yeah, for sure. Um, is about the story of the game. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's a light touch story, I would say. Um, it's told in pictograms. It's told in snatches of dialogue. It's laden with terminology in a way that is like uh, engrossing and confusing at the same time. There's a lot of proper nouns yeah. in here. There's a lot of names. There are people from places that you never really find anything about. Um, and towards the end of the game, I mean, th there are some things built into it that seem to be there to try and help you understand. For example, as you are collecting shaman memories and then unlocking them to see what they really are, there is a way to play them all back so you can see the sequence, which seems very much like, here you go, player, here's the sequence, this is what you've been working towards. Um, but it's, it's still quite abstract in its totality. Um, and it's still quite tricky to, to delve into. I had developed some homespun theories um, that were quite wild, and then went on to Reddit, saw what other people were thinking, and I was completely wrong about everything. They are doing the work over there. Um, so so I was curious about the storytelling in the game. It's abstract. It takes work. Um, was this was this perhaps intended to be the kind of story that becomes a puzzle, that goes to Reddit, like a, like a fez or like a hyperlight drifter, something that it's a group effort, like a big mystery? Um, because I, I felt that that's the way to really crack this story, if you know what I mean. 
I mean, yes and no. It's designed to be obtuse and and uh, mysterious. Mm. I don't necessarily know that it's designed to be solved. Mm. Um, there's a lot of um, of ambiguity uh, ambiguity in there, and a lot of missing pieces. A lot of things that we we've talked about that just really isn't in the game, and that's that's was part of the idea from the beginning. I, I remember when I started, Nicholas had this long speech about this planet named so-and-so where they lived like this. And, and uh, the, the whole, he had a half hour long backstory before we even got to sar- the sarcophagus. Mm-hmm. And that's all hinted at uh, here, here and there in bits and pieces. But I, I, I think we knew from, or, or from as far back as I can remember that we, we wanted us to know those things because that helps us create something that feels more true and organic. Uh, but we don't necessarily need to tell all the parts of the story. Um, so that that said, I'm sure, like if, if Reddit is on the case, they're they're, they're gonna <laughs> they're probably gonna fill in the, fill in the blanks quite well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't I wouldn't say it's been designed as a puzzle in terms of like they're they're gonna f- um, just by putting the pieces together they're gonna find out the grand truth of it all. Mm-hmm. There there there's always gonna be interpretation. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know because um, towards you're the not end of, wrong. <laughs> to, right, towards <laughs> the end of the game, I was thinking, I feel like there is a lot of um, there. Are, it's like a collage of materials, um, and maybe that you one could become very dedicated and keep a notebook and write these lines of dialogue down and try and cross reference them and put it all together. But, um, but when I finished the game um, and got the the good ending, um, and uh, the the ritual takes place and the, the station vanishes and the credits rolled. Mm. I, I felt I felt a little sad. I was like, I want to know, like having made this living network, having come to understand this place, I want to know what this was for. You know, so I sat mm. watching the credits, waiting for the end, the post credits scene that I hoped was coming, and it did come. Um, and there was a little um, a little dot that drops back down into the planet that does seem to refer maybe to the um, the first memory that you get where something falls to Earth. So perhaps mm-hmm. there is something cy- cyclical there, but I, I did sit. I did think. I spent a couple of days afterwards, just sort of combing through it in my memory. I was wondering if there is anything that you would like to share for people that are in my position about about. Um, I mean, absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. I'm not giving you that. Uh, I uh, no. <laughs> no, but it, it's been really fun to see the the narrative. Um, unfold. We we brought in Pelle Candlebu uh, like a, a year or two ago to to actually write all the text for this, and he sort of took a took a, a more holistic approach to just the narrative and and what what you learn when and uh, and and that whole. So he, he's turned all the all the backstory we had and all the gameplay systems we had and turned it into a, a story that the player player moves through mm-hmm. uh, over the course of the game. Um, sorry, hang on. <coughs> uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, it, it, it uh, like you say, it really also fits with the psychedelic vibe of it all. It's uh, it's <laughs> there's a mystery to it. Like there, there's who's this guy? What, do we even exist on the same plane of existence? Um, but you you also. There's enough substance in there that you you kind of want to know more, and you kind of feel like there. If I put this piece together with this piece, uh, I, I might end up at some kind of truth. And I mean, you will, but it might be your own truth. Yeah, that was certainly the case when I looked at my notes and compared it to what the redditors are hard at work crafting. I was way off. I was like had some different dynasty in my in my notes there. So it's definitely creating some plural uh, interpretations. I think we like that. <laughs> Okay, and just to round things out here, I mean, um, you mentioned um, that you mentioned that there are things in the game that people maybe have not noticed or not not found. Uh, when I did get that good ending in Ultros, um, I did wonder: this is exactly the kind of game where this is not a true ending, but rather the t- the second of three. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering what else is hiding in the depths of this game. Are there things that people have not discovered as yet? That's a good question. I don't have full visibility on what people have discovered or not, but um, I, I do know that, know that people have gotten all of the Steam achievements, and, and some of those are pretty well hidden. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are like upgrades to most of the extractor programs that let you do no more stuff. Mm-hmm. 
and like things like little hidden messages and stuff. But hey, I shouldn't be talking about this, should I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're past the spoiler break now. We're, we're, we're with the real, the real Ultras lovers now. So, you know, it's okay to talk this stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But I, I also, uh, it's, it's a game about mystery. So I, I don't want to give, give things away. Um, you, you never know what you're going to find. But I, 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 I do, I would say that the sort of, the, the ending where you connect all of the Shamasal to, uh, to Ultras is, is as much of an ending as you're going to get. But, who knows what else you'll find, right? Yeah, good to know. Um, and finally, I mean, you did mention that you are already working on another game. Um, you talked about it a little bit just now, another ecologically focused game. Um, oh, yeah. Is that at such an early stage that you're able to say anything about it? It is, actually. It was. I think it was announced before Ultras was. Okay. Because uh, uh, it's... Uh, it, or it definitely was because it was announced before, long before I worked on it. Um, it's called All Rise. It's uh, a game where you take oil majors and all their polluting industries to court mm-hmm. uh, by building. Uh, it, it, it's 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 um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, it, it's a deck builder essentially. So you build a deck of arguments uh, as a, as an environmental lawyer, um, and it's it's being run by. Um, a, 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 um, a Dutch research group at the University of Utrecht called uh, uh, Anticiplay that uh, announced this like yeah before they even started working on it really so so it, it, there's been talk about it for a while. The, what's really interesting to me uh, just concerning this is that when you reached out to us, you, you mentioned a couple of games that uh, that you had interviewed or tried to interview previously, which includes Sable. Citizen Sleeper and Science of the Sojourner, mm-hmm. and <laughs> that was so funny to me. That's part of why I, I, I figured I, I have to take this interview because uh, uh, those are core inspirations for this game. Like Science of the Sojourner, obviously a game where you play cards to to hold a conversation. Citizen Sleeper, also like our, our big role playing um, inspiration. Sable, a game that Magna Jayanth wrote. She writes this as well. Yeah, and also games with an ecological focus. Signs of the Sojourner was one of the most interesting climate games that I have played. Citizen Love Sleeper it had its bits. whole deep mycelia thing going on. You know what I mean? These are games that, that are connected in some ways. For sure. I guess Ultras has its place in the in the eco games movement as well. Mm-hmm. It's uh, if, if nothing else, I guess it's immortalized as, I think we can call ourselves the first Gardenvania. <laughs> I, I, I may be missing, I, there, there is always something. There's a case, I guess, for uh, Waking Mars. Uh, not as much of a Metroidvania, yeah. Definitely a gardening game, um, but yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, All Rise is very, very much a. a it's, it, I mean, it, it's run by by researchers and scientists, which makes it the most purpose driven game I've ever worked on, and I'm really excited about that. Okay, where do people go if they want to find out more about that game? Um, our uh, director Joost Vervoort's blog, I guess, or uh, the Anticipate blog, really. Anticipate, I think. He, yeah, I think he, he, he's probably the only one writing on it, but uh, it's the Anticipate play blog. Okay. Well, this has been really, really fun to talk to you about. Thank you for being willing to to take the time. Thank you for being willing to share your design thoughts. and uh, Absolutely. And talk about the game. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the game, and thanks for your time, Hugo. Yeah, thank you. Good luck out there. So that's the interview with Hugo Billet. I hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun to talk to Hugo about the ins and outs of Metroidvania design, the release process, and all of the ideas that are in that brilliant game. Certainly my game of the year so far. Um, If you're interested in hearing more interviews like that, there are a few in the podcast back catalogue. There is one with Madison Carr, the creator of Birth. There is one with Diala Katan Wright, the maker of Signs of the Sojourner. There is one with Gareth Damien Martin when they first released In Other Waters before Citizen Sleeper. And there is also an interview with the makers of Sable. So if you would like to hear any of those, you can go to gaminginthewild.com, click through to Spotify or Apple or wherever you like to get your podcasts and you can find those episodes. I will also link to them in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a subscribe. And if you would like to support this channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild where you can sign up from a dollar a month to join the patron-only Discord, get bonus material, and just help me to keep making stuff like this. So thanks very much for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other, and I'll see you on the next one.